Please patronize our sponsors who support the Guild and our mission to educate members and non-members to enjoy and enrich their woodworking skills and experiences. You pick hardwood lumber, Rockler Woodworking and Hardware, and the W.D. Quinn Saw Company. Good evening. Uh, it is 6.45, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the good news is I just checked the weather report, and any kind of uh, liquid precipitation, whether it's uh, frozen or not, shouldn't get here till after about midnight or so. So we should have no trouble getting the meeting done and getting you all home safely. So I, I, I did just check that. So those of you who don't know, I'm Jay Nossinger. I'm the current president of the Guild. Um, so, looking forward to the, the uh, presentation part of the meeting tonight with Keith, Keith Lassant. Uh, we have a little um, business to take care of before that. So, go ahead and flip. Uh, I somehow lost a couple of slides, and so before we uh, give a chance to see if there are any new members or visitors tonight, I want to at least tell you who, who haven't been here before, who don't know much about how things work, uh, we do have a show and tell. That show and tell is just before the present presentation uh, of the evening. Um, so, are there any new members or visitors here tonight? Okay, my name is Mona Murphy. I have been revamping, rebuilding a house that I bought. I have some woodworking tools that I used, and I've made some things, cabinet doors, different kinds of things. But now I am trying to make countertops and make some other things. I bought a shopsmith from my friend's father, and I want to be able to use it and make some more stuff. So I'm here to pick your brains. That's the way to do it. Thank you. Um, I started with a shopsmith, too. Mark Adams at the Mark Adams School of Woodworking started with a shopsmith, believe it or not. So that's a. Excuse me? <laughs> That's quite an undertaking you're doing, so uh, proud of you. Then. Okay, next person. How you doing? Um, my name's Randy Melovitz, and I just started doing the woodworking in about, a, about a year ago. And I built a shot glass cabinet and a bunch of uh, lathe. I've been working with lathe uh, for a while and making some, uh, uh, made a little, a little box to connect uh, the, I forgot what it's called, a lidded box, that's what it is. Just made that last night wow. over at Woodcraft. Are and, the shot uh, glasses wood? What's that? Are the shot glasses made of wood? Uh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time the doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so. Thank you, it's welcome. It's Thank you. Good evening, my name is Dries Albert. Uh, I'm from Namibia, Southwest Africa, and I work with David at Faust Park. So the easiest na way to pronounce my name is to think of the country Greece. Instead of a G, you do a D. So for tonight, me and David are representing St. Louis County Parks, and we want to, David is going to present uh, in a little, in a few minutes, our the county parks want to work with the guild, and uh, I'll be available to answer questions after his presentation. Nice to be here. Thank you, Dries. Good to see you. Hi, my name's uh, Mike Kenny. It's the first time I'm here, obviously. I watched the video from last month and uh, was interested in finding one of the guys who was here who was talking about a CNC project, about a little oil lamp thing. <coughs> so if anybody knows who it is, let me know. But, oh, okay. All right, so uh, yeah, I uh, want to make some signs and different things. I've done a few projects here and there over the years, but that's about it. That's, we did strategic uh, seating here, so you'd be right beside him. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name's TJ. I moved to St. Louis about a year ago, and uh, I've got some carpentry experience, but the finer woodworking skills uh, have eluded me. So I'd, I'd like to uh, get more smarter. Well, you have a lot of teachers here, yeah. Is there one more over there? 
Anybody else? Hold your hand up. Okay, well, <coughs> welcome all of you, and hopefully you'll uh, end up finding what you wanted here. Uh, I think we have a, a, a wonderful group of people, and uh, hopefully you'll be here for quite some time in the future as, as well then. Um, so, okay, next one. So, Bill Shukat, uh, I think you have some, a little few slides about upcoming uh, presentations and classes. Upcoming presentations, um, Keith is going to be presenting hand-powered scroll saw and other hand-powered tools tonight. Uh, next month, uh, we're having a presentation from the Habitat guys out in St. Charles uh, about Habitat and how it works. Um, Bob was telling me that they have 36 houses under construction right now. They're a busy group. In what kind of area? St. Charles. Just in our area, not nationally, you're talking about. That's just locally. That's, that's just the St. Charles group. Just, just the wow. St. Charles group. Amazing. There's amazing. a St. Louis group that's separate from that. It's amazing. At the March meeting, uh, Dan Lender is going to talk about his uh, building uh, a bedroom set. I think we've seen some um, jigs and stuff that he's used for that, so that should be pretty interesting. Next slide. Upcoming classes, the end of this month, we've got a sharpening class, sharpening straight edge <coughs> chisels and plain blade, blades. Um, and the 28th, we're going to have a morning session doing sharpening and an afternoon session that will be uh, the new fundamentals class. February, um, we have a class on joinery, and then there are two more fundamentals classes first half of the fundamentals class meets every two weeks. Uh, in March, Don Turner is going to teach everybody how to build drawers. On March 9th is our Superstar weekend event. And I'll let Lender talk about that if he wants to talk. There's another fundamentals class. Uh, and at the end of the month, there's a beginner scroll saw class. I think that's all. Um, I don't know if you can read this. I, my reading at this distance isn't so great, so I'm not going to go over it. But there are uh, a whole raft of other classes that are already posted. Um, so go to the website um, and take a look at what's available. And um, it's the only time we've got some open classes that aren't, aren't assigned yet is. Uh, November and December, I think. Back to you, Jay. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Most of you know about our toy program. Um, we have donated toys to many people, but mostly to children and, and uh, children's hospitals and so on, and many other groups as well. Uh, Rich Weissman, I, I say this every month, but he, I think, is the only one left that is a charter member of our, of our guild, starting way back from when the guild started. And he is our toy uh, chairman. Uh, so Rich, give, give, us, give us an update. Um, we had uh, three hospitals that needed toys this month. And if my memory is correct, there were 180 toys that I put in sacks to be delivered to the three hospitals. And we've got a bunch of new toys here, and we can use more toys. We're low on helicopters, even though we got a few tonight. And we're also running a little lower on the guild cars. And uh, so that's where we stand right now. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I think one of the most amazing thing, if you look at the big, the, the total, 1994, it's when this program started, and the number is now over 87,000, if I'm correct. Is that right, Rich? Yes. Of toys donated, 87,000 toys in that period of time. So that's I'm, pretty amazing. I'm pretty sure, though, that that's not from 94. Okay. Um, because we, I don't think anyone but me has a record of how many toys <laughs> were given in those days. You do have... That's good how you got them. When I was the only one that had them, I don't know, but I thought I was. 
So obviously, some I gave it to someone else back then. Um, okay, so Wayne Humphrey is in charge of the Christmas build, toy build, and so on, including the Festival of Trees. Um, and he's just getting ready to get geared up again and start for the, for, believe it or not, in early February for the Christmas of 2024. So, Wayne. Yeah, we're going to start building toys the first Friday in February, be doing it the first and third Fridays of every month. Uh, if you'd like to get an email reminder of that, uh, come and make sure I've got your email address. Try to send out a reminder about Wednesday before the, the build. We've got, uh, we had 1,698 toys that got donated through the Christmas program last year, so. Uh, yeah. We, we meet at the shop to do that, and uh, you're more than welcome to build toys at home and uh, contribute them also. Uh, bring them in. We'll find a place to store them if you don't have room to store them at your house until the Christmas season. We wrap it all up uh, right before Thanksgiving. So. Okay, Dan. Yes, yeah, Superstar, Superstar weekend, weekend is coming. It's March coming 9th. quickly. I talked with Logan just last week, and he's making plans to make a long weekend of it with his wife. So the, the venue room where we're going to hold it is just right down this aisle to what they call the Gateway 500 room. And for those of you that have registered, you'll get an informational email from me approximately uh, February 1st outlining all the details. And then you'll get a, another email asking you to what your choice is for your, from a lunch menu. And those of you that have not registered, there's still plenty of room for you to do so. So, you know, please sign up. It should be a good time with, with Logan. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. He's worked amazingly hard, and he did the program last year, too, and with, uh, with no hesitation, we talked him into, or tried to talk him into coming back this year, and he's, he's at it again, so. Um, Rich, uh, let's see, Logan Whitmer. So he is the uh, current uh, uh, editor-in-chief of Popular Woodworking. Um, that's one of his current titles and so on. So we really look forward to, to seeing him. Okay, so now is the time we're going to enter, we're going to space your Dave and Dries to come up and talk a little bit about Faust Park and new programs that are being presented to us. Okay, my name is uh, David Gronefeld, and I am with the Guild, I am the shop monitor, but I also am uh, a worker at Faust Park. And the park has, uh, my supervisor, Dries, has come to me and asked if uh, I could introduce some ideas to the guild where the guild and the park could work together on a variety of programs that are all kind of interconnected, all having to do with wood. Uh, Dries has written some proposals for the park system and has gotten some wood uh, processing equipment, we have a sawmill, and uh, also uh, splitting, what do you call it? Yeah, firewood splitter that cranks out a bunch of firewood that we can use in the parks. The idea is to utilize some of the many trees that our forestry crew cuts down throughout the park system, and they just basically pile them up in a gigantic pile and then once a year chip them all up into mulch. And so he was looking for a way that those resources could be a little bit better utilized and so he came up with a couple of ideas about that. Uh, and he would like the park system, or, the, or I'm sorry, he would like the guild to participate in some of these programs. So there's basically three components and they all kind of inter interreact. Uh, the first one is the establishment of a enchanted forest. And I'm not sure if that's the actual name that's going to be associated with this in, in the long run, but uh, it's approximately a quarter acre area. It's got a trail that goes through it. And the idea is that we will put out structures that are 
supposedly inhabited by mystical forest creatures, okay? And so what we need is a lot of forest creature homes <laughs> and, and uh, massive amounts of them. Uh, the, the audience is, is aimed at children. Uh, it's supposed to be a venue for us to, the park system, to develop some programs where the children can decorate or participate in constructing some of the structures. They can be placed out in the area. Uh, school groups, art departments can have a particular area or a particular structure that they then work on and can put in the uh, put into the forest. And according to Tom Tierney, millions of people will come <laughs> <laughs> to see this when he when this was introduced to him. That that was his response. <laughs> So we're expecting, we're expecting this to be a popular event. So uh, what do they want the, the guild to do? Is they, they want the guild to participate in building some of the structures and not just homes, but bridges and wind chimes and things such as that. Uh, so the benefits to the guild. Uh, it's a good outreach to the community. Uh, there will be signage associated with this that list who's participated in constructing the the structures that are in the area and we would be on that it would generate goodwill between the guild and the park system uh, to keep up the good relationship that we have with them the force would uh, also uh, give the uh, guild an opportunity for promotion so that people would see that the guild has contributed to this, maybe developed interest in people joining the guild, but it might also generate interest in people wanting these types of structures in their own garden. So the guild conceivably could construct some of these structures that could be sold to the interested parties as a fundraiser for the guild. So. Uh, there is an opportunity that maybe it could be a source of revenue for the guild as millions of people will come. <laughs> Surely some of them would want some of this in their own gardens. We will. We've already got plans for, I've already mentioned that, we'll need a bigger parking lot. Uh, the second component was uh, Dries was interested in developing a class through the park system. The park system already has certain programs and classes that it presents, and it would want one to use the wood that we're, that we're milling to do an epoxy class. And for that, the main component would be know-how. If guild members wanted to assist in instructing the class, and I think we even actually have one member that has already kind of suggested that they would be willing to do that. I also should mention that many guild, or several mem members of the guild have already contributed to the uh, Enchanted Forest. The volunteers, uh, Jerry, Dale, Keith, Al, they've all, uh, Les, I'm not sure, I haven't seen Les in a while, but I, I think maybe Les has been, yeah, Les was, talked about this too. Uh, I've already kind of come up with a couple of structures and uh, Keith has also made some some decorations for him. I got those decorations uh, right over there. I can get those out in just a second here and show you. But he, so, so there's already been some contributions from the guild and I want to thank those members that, that come out and volunteer at, at the park. Uh, they really do help a lot out at the park and do a lot for us, and Keith is going to tell you more about that, I think, tonight. Uh, okay, so I don't know what I, I must have hit the button already. Uh, oh, the art fair. So the third component is August 24th is the park is going to host an art fair, and the art fair will rent slots to school groups, to the public and to the guild 
to present their wares. So for example, if, if the guild were to make some uh, epoxy projects that could be sold, again, as a revenue maker for the guild, the art fair would be a venue for them to sell them. Or the uh, structures for the enchanted uh, forest would also be available for sale. <coughs> Uh, it's kind of focused on the school groups and, and uh, the groups that participate in the Enchanted Forest would be given a reduced fee or maybe even have the fee waived for the, the slot uh, because they had participated in building the structures in the Enchanted Forest so they would be granted a reduced or waived fee for the, the slot. And if a guild, guild members could also individually uh, sell their, if they wanted to rent, they would have to then rent a, a slot, but that would be a venue that guild members could individually sell things if they so chose. But the idea is that the guild would have a venue to sell the items uh, for fundraising in the park system. Okay? so. All right, and then there are some examples of the structures. Uh, wind chimes, I think that's one of the, the middle picture there, I believe, is one of the structures that the, the volunteers out at the park have made, and bridges going between the structures. Down at the bottom is, is a little house that one of the, the park employees has made. Uh, so those are some examples, and I brought a couple other examples that I put on the table over here, I'll get those out. So this would be an example of uh, a small home. It doesn't necessarily have to have a uh, water-powered wheel on the side of it necessarily, but uh, that's a nice touch. Uh, and then Keith left this little package on my desk at the park today. So he's made a bunch of woodland mystical creatures that we can then hang in decoration around in the area. So I've got a whole bag full. I, I guess I should keep it, keep it closed so they don't fly out of there. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, so thank you very much, Keith. That uh, any questions about any of those? Yes, sir. Is this going to be indoor or outdoor display? This is an, the Enchanted Forest is an outdoor display. And we understand that that means that there's going to be deterioration. We, uh, we, we understand that. We just, that's what's going to happen. That's, so that's why we need lots of homes to replenish the ones that deteriorate over time. But yeah, it is an outdoor, that is an outdoor uh, activity. Is this anticipated to be a permanent exhibit is the question. And the answer is yes, it's, it, it's, it's supposed to be permanent so that when we build our larger parking lot, it won't be a waste of money and energy. <laughs> <laughs> because millions of people are going to attend. Hopefully not all exactly at <coughs> the same time, but Dries wants to have add something. Yep, so first of all, I'm here to tell you tonight that county parks want to have a relationship with the guild. Um, this is According to, my, uh, to me, it's the perfect ideal scenario. The government is here to support you. One hand washes the other. So I see a bright future here. I've been at Faust Park for three months. Before that, I was a park ranger. Before that, I come from a highly conservation oriented. I was a federal conservation agent in Namibia. So I've done a lot of research, like Dave mentioned, uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a proposal. The county was wasting wood like crazy. And uh, the statistics are like 900 <coughs> trees a year that our forestry department took out and turned into mulch and gave away for free. Now, if the county has spent $100,000 in getting a mill and a commercial firewood splitter, so those are in place. The next step now is to use the wood. And this is where I see the opportunity with the guild. I see a bright future. 
This proposal here with the guild, everything is going to be new and unique. So there's currently no fairy forest in America or the world. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be number one. <laughs> Which will bring millions, indeed. <laughs> the, the original proposal was drawn up about a year ago. And since then, when I look on the internet to find designs and stuff, it, the, the, it's a lot more. So interest is growing. If we build a forest like this, designated to this, it's going to be a hit, I'm sure of it. And I can definitely, like Dave said, there's the opportunity for the guild to generate money from this. Yep. You'll just have to believe in it. But I can see this picture. It, it makes my eyes happy to look at things like this. A variety. Uh, we actually, our forestry crew brought in like 10,000 pound logs that are about this high. It's already on the trail where we need plan to have the forest. So we're looking for chainsaw carvers. Anybody, there's no restrictions or set limitations to anything. This is absolutely going to be artistic. The question is, is the example that I have sitting out there the approximate size? And it looks like, yes, it is. Uh, so, so, yeah. But, but you know, if the, you know, the picture of the one up there, that door is considerably smaller, I think, than, than that. Uh, on, uh, no, 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 not on yours, Keith. I know yours meets code. I know that <laughs> yours meets code. <laughs> I'm talking about uh, Micah's down there at the bottom. <laughs> that one's just all, I, you know, the, the doors are not necessarily all consistent. What type of time frame are we looking at for this? As soon as we can, but uh, Dries, was there an opening time frame? Yes, we set a date just for ourselves, you know, to get going by, I think it was end of May. But pretty much the guilds got seven months before the art fair. And so you've got seven months to experiment, start creating things, including the epoxy. So the ultimate goal is both to make kids happy and for the guild to generate money. And of course, the park system is going to look good too. So one hand washes the other. That's what we're going for. Yeah, the park. we the original idea was like a thousand of these. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> and uh, you know, w like Dave earlier said, we're anticipating some losses. So through weather and people stealing it as well. Unfortunately, that's going to happen. So we have to be ready for it. A lot of these structures are going to be out of reach, a little bit higher up on the trees. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing about the fairy forest, right now we've got a section of forest that's not used. So it's kind of like a conservation system. We want to show the public that there's other uses to the forest than currently, that's currently in place. So we might be an example to a lot of different parks in, in the county and the rest of the country. It's, I'm convinced this is going to work. Yes, we already have a lot of mold lumber, and uh, John over here is going to help us. He gave us a good idea to use the, those of you familiar with Faust, we've got a greenhouse that's not being used right now. We're going to turn that into a drying room for the lumber. Yep, thanks to John. So we're working on that already. So everything is running as it should be at this stage. Anything you can think of. The question is, what kind of woods are we, have we been milling up? And for the most part, uh, I think mostly, I think we did some hickory. Uh, usually there's some oak in there as well, although I don't remember specifically if we milled up any oak. And we did do a little bit of walnut as well. And I think we also, I know we milled up some Sycamore. 
I think uh, I yeah. doubt that. Uh, we're we're pretty we're, right <coughs> now. We're just using the sawmill and putting it on there and making basically through cuts. Uh, we're not we, so far. We haven't manipulated uh, to produce any particular kind of uh, just plain sawn through and through is what we've been been doing pretty much, uh, and. Uh, we have, I mean, the, there is cherry, uh, but I don't know that we milled any cherry up, but there is cherry logs that we have designated as these need to go through the mill. Uh, so a whole wide variety of, of things. The question is what what kind of epoxy projects were we planning on doing, and that was originally you know tables was what comes to mind. But as we got into it, well, the cost is going to be the epoxy, and this the, so smaller projects seem to be a little more feasible for what we're looking at now for the public for the class type of setting. Uh, so something smaller, a smaller table or a charcuterie board or something along those lines. Uh, for the for that well I think uh, if there's any other questions we'll be here to to uh, answer them later but I think we need to move on to the next uh, item on the agenda uh, thank you all for your attention and for your time uh, I'm done Tom yes yeah, so go ahead you can clap <laughs> and Greece and David, one of the things we talked about at our board meeting just a week ago in this project was to maybe have classes. I think the guild has, has been very good at, I'm willing to come to a group of people doing something. I have no creativity at all. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to create like Keith did all those things and so on, but I'm happy to come to a group of things and you know do a, do a bunch of things together. And, so think of that as another option of how you can utilize the, the guild. Set, set dates and, and we'll see how many people we can get to show up and so on. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, so I just put, instead of just me spouting off and, and not even having it on the program, but just telling you some announcements and so on, uh, I decided to kind of put some things to remind myself what, what I would like to at least mention. Um, we have a mentorship program. It's been led by John Bronson. John, are you here someplace? There he is. And um, I think we, I think he needs help. Where the, the guild is growing, and we need um, uh, to have this be a very active program and a very important program. We say that we have it, and we need to be able to uh, put our um, put our ourselves where our mouth is, and so on, to actually be doing things, and so on. So when people uh, uh, show up, sh excuse me, when they sign up, they um, fill out a questionnaire, and one of them is, would you like to have a mentor? Um, and we haven't done as good of a job as we should because we didn't have the ability, we didn't have the people and so on to be able to do that. Um, some of us, including me, seem to remember when I mentioned this at the last meeting, which is two months ago, if you remember, in, in uh, November, Somebody put their hand up and, and said that they would be uh, willing to help with that, but we don't, nobody wrote it down. And if that person is here, would you put your hand up again? Because we don't know who that was. But anybody, we might be able to go back and look at the replay of the last meeting and so on see, and figure out who that is. But so we really, really, I think John would agree that we, he would like some help too, uh, to be able to, to uh, do a better job and to make this a more active part of our, um, of our guild. Um, I also mentioned at the, at the November meeting um, that we had one commissioned um, activity up to this point. It was making, remaking, making, refinishing and then remaking some signs for a garden, garden group near the hill someplace, so southwest Southwest Garden Association, something like that. Um, it didn't go completely smoothly, uh, but I, I can tell you that I think we're going to come away with about $2,500 or so, even if we don't satisfy them with the new ones that we were, were making. Um, 
but it's too much for one person to do most of the work in addition to the organizing and so on. Uh, so what I think we need is an another guild <laughs> advisory committee person who would be the screener. We get so many, uh, especially Bill and I, get these requests from non-members who say, hey, got your name from uh, Woodcraft or, or Rockler primarily, and could you help, you know, could you help with doing this or whatever? And our, our pat answer is we s uh, send them a letter. They're not, if they're not guild members, and just say what we'll do for you is to send uh, your request out to the 345 members or whatever we're, at, we're up to right now, uh, and then you deal directly with the, or anybody who's interested deals directly with them. That's kind of our pat answer and so on. And that might be, still be the pat, you know, what most of them do. But some of them might, it, the screening person that I'm talking about uh, might find some things, you know what, that they're not a member yet, but they're, we're gonna, they're gonna become a member. And I think that could be a money-making project. We found out in our, in our tour of the Kansas City uh, Guild, which went from being way smaller than us to over 1,200 members in a 12,000 square foot uh, shop, uh, their primary source of income is not dues from, uh, it is commission projects. They started with one commission product project that made over $30,000. So clearly, if we want to in the future, um, and we don't, maybe we would don't need a new shop. Maybe we don't want a new shop. Maybe we'll never be able to afford it. But I think this is a uh, vital part of that look uh, as we're doing a feasibility study for a possibility, the possibility of a new shop. This has got to be in the program to some extent. The kinds of numbers we're talking about compared to just getting dues and so on is not even close. So. So please, if anybody has thought about it, I had somebody that I talked to for about a half hour, and they said they're still thinking about it. So I know who that person is, but maybe I'll have to get back with them a little bit and push, pu pu push them a little harder. Um, but anybody who's interested, remember I told you when I started as the president that uh, my goal was to have people become more active themselves, not just takers in, in this process of being in the guild, but givers as well and uh, volunteering in any way, shape, or form when opportunities avail themselves. Uh, we decided uh, that we're not having a goal right now of making a new shop and how big is it going to be and where is it going to be and so on, but we need to at least be exploring the feasibility of whether we need a new shop and if so, what, how big and so on, so that uh, ultimately uh, if we decide that we uh, are looking towards uh, making a new shop, we would have, th we would then look into the backup of how much is that going to cost. And that's part of feasibility, isn't it? So we, we, can we afford it? Can we not afford it? Do we really need it? And so on. So we started by going and visiting Kansas City. Got a lot of great ideas. We've stolen a lot of those ideas and put them into operation. And it's it resulted, as an example, the sponsorship program uh, it, we're starting to get some income uh, from, from, from things that we learned from the Kansas City uh, visit. The next thing we did was go to uh, Faust Park. Bill Shukat has an uh, architect friend. They've been friends for over 30 years, <laughs> if I remember. And he was willing to meet with us and David uh, at, the, at Faust Park. Uh, Faust Park has been very kind to us, and we, we, I think we have a good relationship with each other, and we want that to continue. They've designated a part of the uh, park, not where the Enchanted Forest is going to be, but <laughs> another park. In fact, it's behind the carousel building. That's kind of where we're talking about. That they think would be okay to have, if we would want to build a shop, a new shop in Faust Park, that's probably where it would be. So the architect looked at that with us, and he's going to come back and give us some his thoughts about um, if we, is, is it, uh, it's kind of down below, we have to worry about pumping sewer up, upwards again like you already do in the, in the South Park, some other places. So we're, we're in the process. We are now, we, we didn't know about this, but Quinn saw, they're amazing people, they have a new shop uh, over near the, the airport. And it turns out, they were the presenters in November, that they have too much space in their new shop. In fact, they have about 4,000 uh, to 5,000 square feet. 
and they would be willing. In fact, they're looking for somebody who might be interested in leasing that area. And their old shop, in fact, would be open for somebody to look at for renting. I don't know the difference, or I know the difference, but I don't know why they're li looking to lease one and rent the other one or what's behind that. So we're going to get our committee together and schedule uh, a meeting with the uh, Quinn Saw people to go over, and this would be a second idea. The first one would be to build the shop. This would be to lease an existing building and so on. Uh, and uh, they would be wonderful. Um, What's the name? The landlords. I think they would be certainly, you couldn't find better landlords. They're just incredible people. So that's coming up next. We're also going to talk to the Makers Space people. They have a lot of equipment, and, and it, there's difference of opinion about how much space they have. Makers Space, but I'm not sure exactly. How. But anyway, we're going to look into working with them. Is there a possibility we might work with them in some way? even if it isn't um, sharing, sharing shop space and stuff like that. Uh, we absolutely, Vicki, you ready? We absolutely need uh, volunteers to look at volunteering for uh, filling spaces. We don't have a year that I that's January to January. Ours is the end of April until the end, the end of April. The big it, yeah, the end of April. Um, the election is in April. The April meeting is the election of new um, board members, including a president, a vice president, um, and the secretary and treasurer have, uh, have uh, expressed their willingness to continue next year. So, but it's still an election for those people. Uh, and uh, a director, what's called a director. Um, they're having some difficulty in in finding uh, volunteers for especially the president and vice president. Um, so the president and vice president are not going to be here. And that's going to be as of the end of the meeting on April. We're, go we're going to be gone. So we need, we need to get new people. And we've had strong people, and we need to continue to have strong people. Uh, so Vicki Berry is the president or the, or the head of the nominating commi committee. She's the chair. And Vicki, I think, would like to expand. Just a couple words. As Jay said, um, we are having reluctance, I guess, <laughs> uh, from some of our more seasoned members to step up to be president and vice president. Uh, I know it can be seem like it's a daunting task to run this organization, but I think Jay will attest, and I, as a past president, will certainly attest. It's, it's not as difficult as you may imagine. Uh, we are also looking at taking some of the vice president duties that Bill has taken on outside of the definition of that position so that it is not as overwhelming and as much hardship as I think it really is now for Bill. So we're looking at that. We know we have a lot of talent and experienced people here in leadership positions in their past lives, and we would love to take advantage of that. So Wayne Humphrey, Tom Tierney, and I are the nominating committee, and we would love to uh, hear from you. And as I, on a, now on another note, as I was walking in tonight, I realized that uh, uh, we didn't have a cake tonight which is what we usually do in January to just kind of celebrate our calendar year end. So if we can get some candidates by the end of the meeting today, I will be happy to bring in cake and ice cream at our February meeting. So how's that for a bribe? Don't be shy, and we would love to talk to you. Thank you. We had a lot more treats when Vicki was the president, so <laughs> <laughs> we, we, did, we are missing that, I'm sorry. Uh, I did, in my president's letter, make a big deal about uh, daunting tasks, yes, but I guarantee you that our um, uh, executive board, which is nine people, as well as an, a, a very large advisory board, have incredible talent. And so many people that you can, somebody who's thinking about being vice president or b president, um, they would have lots of help, as Vicki Vicky and I both said then, so 
Any questions about that? Please come forward. Don't be bashful. All right. And then the final thing I put down, anybody know McGraw, Millhaven? He's a media person, talk show. Um, I, it's uh, 5.50, I think, on the dial. It's a morning, morning program. He's a woodworker. In fact, he talks about it all the time in his program. He found out, he himself goes to, has gone to all the woodworking shows. He called the woodworking people himself personally. He found out that they have penciled in um, February 23rd, 24th, and 25th for St. Louis. They told him that St. Louis is the biggest market they have of all the woodworking shows, which kind of surprised me because certainly they've gone downhill over the last 10 or so or more years. Um, he doesn't have a site because the places where it's been in the past, which have been in, in, uh, in Collinsville, and it's also been at St. Charles at their place, they're booked because, you know, this is kind of a late, late thing. But they need it. They apparently are willing to come. They have it penciled in. If anybody knows a possible place for a woodworking show, it's kind of it's really unlikely going to happen because of the time to actually develop everything that needs to be developed. But McGraw would be j really r happy to hear from anybody who has any ideas about trying to make that happen then. So there's a chance. There's a limited chance that there might be a woodworking show. If not, I kind of have a feeling, if nothing else changes, that they will have time to plan it next year, and we'll be back next year. So, all right. Is, that, is the next one the, the reason? No. Oh. So, um, I told you we have show and tell. Uh, several people have signed up. Before everybody else comes up, I wanted to uh, have every people look at this magnificent 18-wheeler sitting up here. Uh, there is one woodworking store in Metro East, thankfully. I live in O'Fallon, Illinois, and it's, it's uh, in uh, Troy, Trenton, excuse me, and uh, it's called Kuntz Carpentry. So I went in there to give them some uh, handouts and get a couple things and so on and saw this on the, on the wall there. It had a sign, $70, $50 on sale. Turns out that this was made by somebody in the, their uh, business. Uh, I said, do you have plans? And they said, no, because he, it's, he just kind of did it himself. Uh, so there are no plans for this particular 18-wheeler. <laughs> so what I'm showing it to you for is first I talked to Wayne Humphrey about possibly having this ultimately, one of them being donated for the uh, Festival of Trees and so on. I think it would look nice. Uh, Vicki helped too do the decoration and so on for that event. So, uh, so I'd like somebody uh, who likes to uh, do things uh, like ma making plans and so on, maybe volunteer to take this 18-wheeler home so that we come away with, with, with uh, actual plans that I anybody in the guild could use then, like we do with a lot of other toys. I have a, a volunteer, but that person is kind of really, really busy, so I'd like another volunteer, too, to be able to do that. So that's the only reason I did not make this, but I could make another one if I had plans. I told you I have no creativity, so. Um, so that's the, that's the reason that's not a show and tell. It's just to let you know about it. Okay, show and tell people. Bill, shoot out. Uh, and start to come up people in line with, that you kind of wrote down. Uh, to be presenting and showing things that you brought in to tell about. And Bill is going to show a table. Hi, guys. Um, what I brought in was a, a shaker table um, that I made. And this is now the number two project in the fundamentals class. Uh, previously, we'd made a tool chest. And I found that uh, a lot of the students uh, didn't get it done. It was a, a bigger project with a lot more components than this. Um, and try as they might, um, a lot of them didn't get it done. Um, so w when we went to uh, Kansas City last summer, um, they were making a table similar to this. 
uh, as part of their equivalent of our fundamentals class. Their program's a little different than ours. Um, but I was very pleased with uh, how the current class, which just ended, did. Um, three people in the class didn't 100% finish, but basically finished. Um, and I thought I'd, given that I was asking them to build it, I figured I'd need to put one together and show them how it, how it worked. Um, this one is Cherry. Um, it was, it's finished with shellac. Uh, the top had a uh, final top coat of polyurethane so that it doesn't get messed up when somebody puts a drink down on it. Um, first time I'd uh, done a tabletop with polyurethane and found a good uh, YouTube video about finishing that. I thought it came out pretty nice. Uh, the polyurethane is a little bit cloudier looking than if it was just a shellac finish, but I thought it came out very nice. And this will be around for, uh, at my house for a couple of weeks. Um, and I've uh, already designated it for my cousin Roz. So, um, what this project has in it is primarily mortise and tenon joints. And we teach that as part of the class. The drawer requires dovetails and half line dovetails. Uh, we teach that as part of the class. Um, at the beginning of the class, we teach everybody how to sharpen their tools. Uh, and we teach them how to square up a board. If you're going to build furniture and your pieces aren't square, good luck getting that put together. Um, feel free to come up and take a look at it. Actually, um, the class does not include the inlay. I took an inlay class from Don Snyder several years ago. And that's the first time I've done inlay uh, in three years. Um, it wasn't perfect, but I was satisfied. Good enough that I can give it away. So what's that's the all wood? I, what's the wood in, in that oh, band? It's cherry. No, in the band. Oh, the inlay is uh, maple. Maple. <coughs> you want a contrasting wood that can show off the the inlay yeah. there. I think a lot of you would agree, if you do the fundamental class, you'd like to go home with that than a, than a toolbox. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Rob, Rob Stout? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, my wife, um, got a different refrigerator and it needed a surround. So I made this cabinet, just, this is a single piece. And then the top piece that, that's all squared up and it's two cabinets and then put the trim on. And then um, I had shaker doors um, in, that go all around the, the old cabinetry. So I made new, new shaker doors. Um, I was able to um, get the Wayne's coating from the previous um, coverage for the for the um, old refrigerator, so I was able to kind of make that. And then this is the glue up of the shaker doors, and uh, this is a cull to keep them flat. Um, and then this is the finished cabinetry. So these were solid doors, and then the shaker doors up there. And then I thought it turned out pretty good. Um, you know, the thing that, um, that I didn't like was the way this door hung. It's, it's the right height, but then it, it slants down. And I couldn't quite figure out why that happened. Had something maybe to do with the hinges. But I'm going to probably end up putting a shim in to pull that up and to bring it in. because. This is about an eighth of an inch, which is what I wanted it to be. And somehow I ended up with it about a half inch distance. So it's one of those things that I was, I'm gonna have to keep tweaking it to try and get those doors to be just right, you know, so. And what's the top coat? What's the finish? 
Um, mm -hmm. It's a sprayed, um, it's a sprayed uh, polyurethane um, latex paint. Thank you. Yeah. And if you get a bigger refrigerator, all you need to change is that middle, right. middle piece of wood. You can make it bigger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we won't get another. Right. So that, that doesn't fit. Any the other questions? one fit the whole space, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any questions for Rob? It turned out pretty good, I thought. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Brad I'm Brad Bernhard. Um, I've done a number of these type of boxes uh, over the past year and a half. Um, I brought this one in because this is the first one I've added marquetry as a way to embellish the box. Um, I started doing solid wood boxes and then I flipped over to shop sawing my own veneer. This is one of several shop sawing veneer boxes that I've done. The joinery in this um, is the typical joinery that Doug Stowe taught us uh, in the Superstar Weekend two years ago and that is contained in some of his books. I would credit him for the tight joinery due to hidden splines. Um, and other things, some of the jigs that uh, I've built that he recommended using. The marquetry exploration I've gotten interested in mostly in the past year. The lid on this uh, is a bird on a branch. Um, this is one of the projects that's in a book we have in our library by Craig Vandal Stevens. I just turned it back into Al tonight after he reminded me that I've had it for longer than I should have. My <laughs> apologies. Um, in that book, they discuss or he discusses ways to uh, use a fret saw to do this style of marquetry. Um, I'm also using this as a little bit of an advertisement because in May it didn't show up tonight, but. Uh, I'm the presenter and I'm gonna talk about marquetry and my experience in the past year. The last thing I wanna say about this particular box um, is I had never done any type of wraparound picture on a box and so the leaves that are below this bird, um, I flipped the other box that this was on after I made these and decided to put it together with this picture on the lid and the technique of how that wraps around um, was my first uh, time to do that and I think it was fairly successful. Marquetry is a lot of fun. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I brought in a new project that I'm starting and I've got a sample of how it begins and the transfer paper, this is an image off of the internet that was a picture um, and once you learn some of these techniques, you can go experiment with a lot of different uh, subject matter that you can find on the internet from photography to cartoonish pictures. I have two pieces of shop song veneer that I brought in as well. And so I would encourage anybody that's interested uh, to ask me some questions. I can be a resource for it. I hope you'll attend the May uh, meeting, uh, and uh, I hope there's other people in the guild here that's together with us that has an interest in marquetry. Um, I think it's fascinating. Thank you. I don't think Brad gave the definition of marquetry, but it's basically the use of veneer enhancements to make a picture. You? Good evening, everybody. I'm Corey Donner, for the ones who don't know me. Uh, this actually is my first show and tell. I joined our guild about two years ago. Uh, some of you have actually, if you were out at the guild shop, actually saw me turn this, uh, which actually it was kind of nice to actually have those people there with me. It was kind of like a journey. Uh, back in 2019, COVID, I had decided I was going to want to go turn with some of the greats like Mike Mahoney and Glenn Lucas. And I said, I'm gonna go with Glenn. You know, and I'm trying to tell you, I said, you know, he's got a you know, good school over in Ireland and a great time to travel. <laughs> well, COVID-19 happened. Next, my trip. <laughs> yeah. So I ended up getting his video, 
and then I actually had a chance to do a Zoom meeting with him. And eventually, I asked Glenn, I said, Glenn, I said, can you send me a piece of that Irish olive ash? <laughs> because this is actually native to Ireland. Uh, this piece actually was flown in. And uh, believe me, if you have this in your backyard, hold on to it, it's a gold mine. <laughs> but today what I actually present to you is the traditional Irish olive ash platter. Thank beautiful, you. beautiful, Tom. You're a quick learner. <laughs> I'm Jerry Baines. Uh, I have a new granddaughter born New Year's Eve last year. So I, my wife says I have to build this uh, chair for her. It was all her idea. And I just finished it up before her first year <laughs> duration. Uh, the big challenge I had was trying to figure out how to do an inlay piece uh, if I buy the right templates the first time, it would have worked a lot better. But it's basically made out of oak that it's stained walnut with a couple of pieces of um, uh, walnut dowel rods for the nose and so forth. The plans had the through screws and then you uh, put buttons on the end of it. So I just put uh, pocket screws because it's on the bottom. Who's going to see it anyway? Uh, I think that cleaned up the looks quite a bit. and. Uh, it's my one-year project that, uh, that I work on. And uh, I got a favor is I was wanting to put a penny in the bottom of it, and I can't find a 2022 shiny penny, if anybody has one, and they'll uh, glue it in the bottom. Um, I don't have any change. Nobody <laughs> uses change anymore. But there's the chair. Good evening. My name is Craig Noel. I got a couple projects here. I've, I've made a number of clocks. And uh, a friend of mine, well, a friend of my sister's, had a uh, uh, red oak, no, a red maple that had to come down in the yard. And she asked me if I would make something. Didn't care what, but she made wanted something out of that. Well, she was pretty rotten. But I got a couple of uh, cookies that were 18 inches in diameter and about five inches thick. And uh, it was still pretty green. So I didn't want to really wait years or whatever to, to do anything with it. So uh, I split it and just with a, a maul, a wedge and a hammer, and split it down and, and then uh, finished up the sides and made this clock out of it. And it's simple as can be, you know. I mean, anybody can, with a, with a splitting maul and a bandsaw, that's what I did it with. Uh, actually, I got three pieces out of here. Um, the clock is just uh, something you just pick up anywhere, drill a two-inch hole in it with a Fossner bit. And uh, I think they'll like it. And I've got a lot more of these wedges that, uh, that I've got, that I don't have a use for, or I do, but, so anyway, what I'm getting at is that I brought three extra, and they're for anybody that wants them. Uh, I've cooked them in the oven for an hour at 210 degrees, and it came out, uh, uh, my uh, meter showed 11, 12%. So uh, I figured that was kind of good enough for this year. And uh, so I'm going to leave them up here. Anybody wants them, help yourself. The, it comes out real uh, when they uh, when they're split. Uh, actually, the edges are really rough. I just I just put it on the bandsaw and just smoothed that out, and then with a uh, sander, sanded them down. Uh, this other little clock here, it's done with uh, I think seven pieces of veneer. That, uh, that I soaked in water, cut a form around it with plywood, and then uh, uh, pressed them together until they dried, and then uh, pulled it off and coated them with glue and glued it together again, and did the same thing with, uh, with a clock here. So this is just a little thing to, for a desk clock that, that uh, if anybody wants to get into bending wood, 
a little project like this with just veneer works out really good instead of wanting to, you know, we saw a bunch of, uh, a bunch of wood. I saw somebody brought a piece of uh, thicker wood that I think they tried to bend after they heated it up in water. Well, it didn't work. I didn't talk to the person, whoever that is, but I imagine it's because it was pretty thick. You know, it looked like it was like three-eighths of an inch of thick or so, but that's pretty thick. And the other thing here is this gentleman's valet that, that I'm really happy with here. This, I kept this on my dresser. I built a dresser, a cherry wood dresser that uh, I got all my wood I got for this cherry dresser. Couldn't bring it, it was way too big. Came from, uh, from, you uh, pick, <laughs> you pick, hardwood. Uh, Rob Stout, sorry Rob. <laughs> He uh, cut down a bunch of trees, had uh, trees removed from his yard, and we did a little trade. He gave me the cherry, and I built this dresser. Anyway, I built this dresser, and my wife says, you're going to have all, you're going to ruin it because all your crap is going to be on top of the dresser. <laughs> I said, I got a solution for that. And I saw this in Woodsmith, I believe it was the magazine, and uh, it's really nice. The, uh, the wood is, is spalted, I think, hackberry, but it could be something else. I'm not sure what it is. You know, the uh, the top here is uh, is maple, and um, and there's another little piece of uh, some exotic wood here that I don't know what that is either. I don't take very good notes when I'm making things. So anyway, you got any questions? Oh, this is uh, finished. This is finished with deft uh, brushing lacquer. Three coats of that on there. Um, I really like that finish, by the way. The other one, this is, uh, anybody ever used tried and true? It's a really good oil rub to put on, uh, on it's really nice on bowls and, and turn projects, but it's good for anything, too. This other one was a couple coats of shellac and then uh, brush on, uh, brushed on polyurethane. So, that's what I got. Thank you. For those of you who don't know what spalted means, it's wood that's basically moldy. <laughs> it's got mold growing on it and so on that uh, doesn't do a lot for the wood necessarily, but it has a lot of uh, aesthetic qualities and so on. So it's favored by woodworkers and so on to make things, especially turning and so on. Hi, I'm Wayne Humphrey, and uh, last Thanksgiving I saw something on the internet uh, about a guy who built a little box and uh, using a scroll saw. And we probably all made a bandsaw box at some time, and so I decided to make one with my scroll saw. Took a piece of mahogany, uh, just cut it just like you would a bandsaw box, and you end up with something cute like this. Uh, it's cute, it's not tremendously functional, it's about one <laughs> ring in each drawer, but uh, my wife likes it, and so I scored big points with that. You bet. Um, there's a, uh, a scroll saw beginner's class, March 24th. If you don't own a scroll saw, it's a good chance to learn. If you own one, you know, maybe I can shorten your uh, learning curve a little bit in three or four hours. Uh, and if you don't know what you can do on a scroll saw, Take a look at the back table back there, what Rich Sanders brought in, and you can do some phenomenal work with a scroll saw. Doesn't occupy much space, doesn't create much dust. It's a good beginner piece of equipment. Safe, it's safer than a lot of things for kids. Absolutely. <laughs> and it doesn't look like this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. So we'll need millions of these, right? <laughs> Is there one more or not? Yes. Yeah. Oh. oh, that's, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, I'm Tom Tierney. I do the uh, Home Sweet Home uh, Community Outreach Table Program. And this is a uh, kit that I'm hoping someone will take home with them and uh, put it together and finish it. It's mostly finished, just needs some uh, good sanding. And uh, we've, we've been putting clear on it, but if you've got extra uh, stain you can certainly uh, put it on here whatever whatever you uh, want 
So we're up to uh, 181 tables that we've donated to Home Sweet Home. And uh, we do have more wood thanks to uh, uh, Jay. Uh, and we'll have some out in the shed here next week. So get on the website, look at the program. It's a, it's a good program. Uh, people really like the tables and uh, we appreciate it when you get involved. And you know, some people can't afford the fundamentals class. You know, you can build this table for free. <laughs> Another kind of show and tell, not something that I made. Um, it's hard to keep good, uh, expensive, quality tools from getting uh, rusty and so on. Um, I, when I got some reasonably good uh, Lee Nielsen uh, planes, um, they at the time, Lee Nielsen, had these kind of socks of various sizes that went over the planes and so on. Um, and they had Lee Nielsen right on there. Well, I know Lee, N Lee Nielsen didn't make them themselves, but somebody else did. Um, in fact, they're having, they had a lot of trouble with, uh, like a lot of people with COVID and so on, to kind of recover from that. So I got, uh, somebody got in touch with me from North Carolina, and he is in the business. His, his sacks are called Sack Up. And so I'm just going to, just as we're doing the, pr the program and so on, we can just pass this around and see. So I guarantee you the one, the one great value is it really does help to stop rust and so on. So this is a one for a number four, actually a 604, a bedrock. So don't, don't trash my bedrock for number four plane and so on. But you're welcome to take it out, look at it and so on. Well, anyway, and this is his uh, little uh, saw container and so on, they're, they're kind of neat. Uh, I had a bad, bad axe saw that unfortunately I wasn't paying attention to and it did get rust on it and so on. So these are just a couple examples. He's willing to be a sponsor and give a discount and I will at least send you out th his thing. And then what we ought to put an addition on there of Dan's source of something that would be very similar for a lot less than this. And he's also willing to give you the discount, but also to put a 5% straight to the guild, you know, something like that. So as maybe we'll have to call it something other than a sponsor. So we just start these around. So I hate to admit, but I'd been in the guild for quite some time, many years. I did not know the origin of the guild in, in uh, Faust Park. So there have been five people, Keith Lassant being one of them, who volunteered to help Faust Park with various things. Uh, things would come up and uh, they needed something repaired or whatever. And so these five people are still doing it in the guild, have been there at a good Tuesdays and Thursdays? Just Thursdays. Just Thursdays and so on. They've been going for how many years has it been? Uh, since about 2006. Since about 2006 or so. So that, that has gone a long way towards um, our, our um, synergy with, uh, with Faust Park and so on. Um, so Keith, being one of those people and so on, has, has been working at Faust Park and working with them and know, knows a whole lot about the history. And I think that will be very valuable for us. So he's not going to just talk about his amazing uh, people-powered uh, scroll saw. He's going to go into the actual the history of Faust Park, and I'm really looking forward to that. So thank you, Keith. Okay, uh, as we said before, about 2006, uh, the guild decided to have their picnic out at Faust Park. And when we did, uh, Jesse, who is, the, is now the... Uh, Cultural site coordinator. <laughs> cultural site coordinator, uh, gave us a tour of the buildings that they had out there. At the time, there were four, maybe five buildings in their village that had been moved uh, from, in most cases, within a mile or two uh, to the park. You can see four of the buildings. Uh, after the 
the tour, we were sitting around with our, having our picnic, and three or four of us decided uh, that maybe it would be a good thing since we're woodworkers and they needed a lot of woodworking repair stuff done uh, to try to volunteer out there. Uh, it turned out that I was the only one that was able to actually fit it into my schedule. So I started working out there uh, using the, the maintenance department's tools. In, we didn't have the shop out there at the time. So I used the maintenance department's tools. Uh, next slide. The first project that I worked on was at the Mertz cabin, which you can see here. And if you see on the far end of the porch there and the close-up, there's a dog-powered butter churn. Uh, the way it would work is that the, the dog would walk, trot, on that treadmill, which would then turn the, the iron wheel which moved a lever up and down, and you, you can't see it real well in that picture, but there's a bar across the top, and then the churn would hook onto the other end of that bar and move up and down so you could churn the butter. You didn't have to stand there all day. <laughs> you let the, the dog do the work for you. It was a, a bit of a challenge in order to uh, to build it, to <laughs> rebuild it, because I had to, to figure out what, uh, what all the parts were and how they worked and so forth. But I did manage to get that done. The next project that I had was on the back of the Mertz cabin. The set of steps there was rotting away. It's an interesting set of steps. Uh, if you're familiar with building of a trestle table, uh, you have a, a board with a long tenon on it that sticks through a mortise and then a wedge that drives through that in order to hold it tight. Well, that's exactly how these steps were built. The three steps all have tenons on them that go through a mortise in the side. And then the, the top and the bottom step uh, have a mortise in them so that the wedge fits down in and holds everything together. And then that's fastened to the back of the, the steps. So it was woodworking that we, a lot of us are familiar with but it's something that I hadn't seen before. About that time, uh, they got another building. They got the old schoolhouse. And they took it apart in big wall sections, uh, laid it on a flatbed truck, and moved it back here, and then reassembled it. When they reassembled it, uh, well, I, I got involved after they had started reassembling it. I, was, I worked on the inside, putting in the floor and building a, a raised portion at the one end for the teacher to be up on. But also, they had to make it handicapped accessible. So the, the door was just wide enough to be handicapped accessible, but it had a step up. So we built a, we designed a porch that went onto it and then built a, a dirt ramp up to that porch. And you can see the handrails on the sides of the, the porch. Uh, when I built those, I wanted to make them uh, a design that would, would represent a schoolhouse. So, 
up at the top, you can't see it real well in the picture there. It sort of looks like a bird, but it's supposed to be an open book. In the center, there's a, a quill pen and a bottle of ink. And then across the bottom edge there are arithmetic symbols, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, so that you have reading, writing, and arithmetic for the school. The next project that we had, and was done basically the same way, was a gen the general store. This was in Fenton, and we disassembled it, took it apart in big wall sections, and there were several of us. By this point, uh, we had a, a number of other volunteers who had, had come out and started to help too, so that we helped, went down, took the building apart in big sections, and loaded them on the, the flatbed truck, then hauled them back to the park and reassembled them. Then when we re reassembled them, we had to, to repair double hung sash windows and the, uh, we built the back section of the, the main general store. They had some old printing tools, machinery, that they wanted to set up. So we built the cherry handrail around it to set it off from it, to keep it separate. And then we also had to make this handicapped accessible. So we had to enlarge the back door that you see there. It's a Dutch door when we made it, so that in theory you could open the top and just let people look in from the outside, or you can open it all, all the way and uh, let people in. And we built a ramp on the back side of the building uh, that the that a wheelchair could get up, turn, and come in. Uh, also, also part of the, the general store, it was set up as a uh, post office. And we had a bunch of old mailboxes that we built, that we refurbished the case, the mailboxes themselves, got them functional, and then built the case for them to, to be in to be inside the general store. The second side of this general store was a, a carriage shop, uh, auto repair shop in its lifetime. And so at the moment they've got a number of carriages there. The one shown here is an old mail truck. And we had to rebuild, uh, Al Carlson did most of the, the work on this, uh, rebuilt the whole upper portion of it with the, the windows and so forth to fit onto the wagon so that we'd have a, the old mail truck. One of the, the buildings that they've gotten recently was an old uh, schoolhouse for the, the black people, black students. Uh, it's one of the few that still exists and it was found as a, somebody was using it as a garage. They had, had cut the door out of the end of it and had it a very large opening for the garage door and the two side windows here, they had cut all the way down to make doors to go into their house. So uh, they were gonna just tear it down and build a bigger garage at the, on the, their house. And Jesse managed to talk them into donating the, the building. They had to go over there, dismantle it. They took it apart log by log by log marked each one of them, 
uh, so that they know, knew where they went back in. And then, uh, for instance, the logs under the windows here had to be replaced with full length logs. Uh, we had to, to frame in for the front door, build the front door, uh, build windows for it, and repair uh, shutters. We had, had some old shutters that were in fairly bad shape that we had to, to rework, and uh, those were hung on the outside. You can see the finished schoolhouse there on the other side at the dedication. Uh, Channel 9 also came out and did a program on this schoolhouse, the rehab. There were two or three sessions. Uh, this is one where they came out and uh, got some pictures of us in the, the shop fixing one of the shutters there and building a door for the entranceway. One of the the projects that we don't always do old projects. Some of the stuff is new projects. And one of the ones that we're working on, but it got uh, sidelined because of other buildings that, that have to be rebuilt, the schoolhouse, the black schoolhouse being one of them. And there are two other uh, log cabins that are a part and will have to be rebuilt before we can get back to this. But we started to build a demonstration building that would show a bunch of the different types of joints that people would have used so that they don't, they're not nailed together. They've got locking joints. And you can see a couple of them on the far side there. But there are a couple more on this side. And in some cases, uh, they're held together with dowel pins. Another project that we had is we took this wagon and built a chuck wagon box for the back end of it that they can use for their chuck wagon dinners. Uh, it can be removed so that this, this wagon is sitting out in front of the, the blacksmith shop right now without the box on it, but when they have the chuck wagon dinners, they can drop the, the box in it and use it for the, the dinners. Then we get to some of the fun stuff. <laughs> they have several different festivals and programs uh, out at the park. Some of them we, got, we have gotten involved in. Uh, at Halloween time, they have a, one of the things that they, they, would wanted, they asked for were a couple of coffins. So we built them two coffins. We, we built one first, and they liked it a lot, so we built a second one. We used as much of the old technique as we could for building them. And you, you can see the, the top uh, in this close picture here. On the far side, we've got uh, two of the coffins standing there. The, the people have great fun looking at the, the coffins or, and standing in front of the, the coffin like they're in the, the coffin. We've also had a few people who uh, <laughs> have hissy fits <laughs> about their kids wanting to do that. <laughs> they don't want them in a coffin. Another one of the things that they have is a fall festival. And I think this is probably the one that we have the most fun at because uh, one of the buildings is an old uh, shop that we've set up. We, we built the, the chandelier for the, that's 
shown in the one picture there. Uh, and we demonstrate the use of old tools. Uh, we've got a, a shave horse there that they can use and see how to use a spoke shave and a uh, draw knife, things like that, to make round tables or you know, chair pieces and, and that type of stuff. Uh, Dave uses those to make, make chairs, <laughs> does a lot of draw knife yeah. work. Uh, one of the other things that we have there is a spring pole lathe. And you can just see in the picture that there's a, a rope here that goes up to a pole uh, at the ceiling. And the, you push down on a treadle on the bottom, and that turns the, the piece of wood that you're going to turn. And you can carve on it. When you get to the bottom of the stroke, you let, let your foot back up, and the spring pole pulls it back up. The hardest thing about working with a, a tool like this is that on a modern lathe, you go in and you just keep working. With a spring pole lathe, when the wood goes backwards, you've got to pull the, the chisel back off of the, the wood. So it's in and out, and in and out, and in and out, and in and out. We're in the process right now of building a uh, pedal power drive for this lathe. Uh, we've got the parts made, but it takes a lot of adjustment, and we, <laughs> we haven't had time. Uh, we got called away on other projects, so we haven't gotten back to it. As I said, we use a lot of the old tools. Uh, got a brace and bit here that we use to, uh, actually these pictures are pictures of that demonstration building that I was telling you about. So that uh, when we put a wooden peg in it, we drilled it with a brace and bit. We cut all of the, the mortise and tenons uh, with chisels and saws the way that they would have been done. And obviously we use a lot of hand planes. Now, one of the other, my, my toy, uh, is this pedal powered scroll saw which we use at the, the festivals and we've used it at the woodworkers shows and so forth. People love to sit, sit and watch this. This saw was actually built in 1876. It's got a date stamped on it, patent pending 1876. So the patent was not, we know that the patent was issued. It was issued about, oh, three, four years later. So by 1880, they would have had patent number such and such printed on them. Uh, you can, can get a lot of replicas of these. This happens to be an old one. Uh, I first saw one of these down at Silver Dollar City and had a chance to, to buy it except uh, when I was newly married, $400 was a lot of money. <laughs> and besides that, I had to figure out how to transport it from Branson, Missouri, up to St. Louis. And obviously, they're not, <laughs> not the easiest things to carry around. Uh, I happened to, to be in Webster Groves in one of the hardware stores there and saw a flyer for a, uh, a sale, an auction that they were having. 
there, and they listed this. I called them up and said, first of all, is it really there, part of the auction? And they said, yes. Does it work, or is it broken? I have, I have looked on the internet and seen a lot of them for sale, and if you really look closely, you find out that one of the legs is broken on them, or they're broken someplace else. Uh, and he said, no, it's, it's perfectly fine working. Uh, we wouldn't ordinarily sell it at something like a small auction like this, but we have to sell it. The person needs to sell it. Uh, so I arranged to, to get there for the auction. Uh, I think, actually, I was the only one bidding on it. They had, I had asked ahead of time what they expected to get for it. And what they expected to get for it was a, about the same that I would have paid down in Branson for a replica. And so I, said, I figured, OK, I'll go try. And the, uh, I think they had one or two people that were in there bidding it up so that I would get, go that far. Because obviously, you know, you, you start at $100 and you, you bid up. Uh, but I wasn't worried about <laughs> going that high. Uh, but I did get it. Uh, I have had to do a little bit of repair work on it. The, the piece here cracked, and so I made a brass cap here to take the stress off the wood. And the, whoever had the top, had the saw before, had put a, a thin piece of plywood nailed down on the top here, which was in pretty bad shape too. I removed that and sanded it all smooth. It works exactly the same way that uh, the scroll saws do. I can use the same scroll saw blades that I use on my powered saw at home. I think this one is a number three. Uh, use a, a lot of other hand tools and, and so forth out at the park. Uh, when we get a, a project, one of the first things we look at is how would it have been done period-wise. Uh, basically, the, the village in the park is from 1860, uh, time of the Civil War, 
uh, till 1910, 1920, somewhere in there, uh, for the buildings that are out there. So we try to use techniques and materials uh, as best matched to that to what would have been done in that time period. Uh, we have done some blacksmithing. Uh, we have some people out at the, the park that are much better blacksmiths than we are, so we don't do a whole lot of it. But there have been a couple of times that, uh, that we've needed something made and didn't have somebody available to do it. So Jesse let us fire up a uh, forge and make something ourselves. So some of the catches and, and some of the hinges and things like that, gate closures, uh, we have actually made too. And just a, a last word on, on this. It's the work that we're doing volunteering to the park that pays our rent for the shop. Uh, because of what we're doing out there for the park, and I, I don't quite know how it originally happened, uh, whether it was Jesse's idea or whether it was Wayne Watson's idea or how it was, but uh, it was decided that we could take an old chicken coop out there that was basically just being used as storage space and we got into it and cleaned it out. Uh, the park put the stove, put the wood burning stove in there for us uh, and has basically let us do what we want in there. There are some restrictions. Uh, we've had to, to make sure that we have two exits for, because the fire marshal's not happy if, if we don't. Uh, we had to, to put in a, a fireproof cabinet to, to store the paints and so forth in it. But largely it's the, the relationship between the park and the guild that lets us work out there. Uh, there are some uh, guild members out at the park and they're there are some other people who have been trained on the use of the tools. We don't too much like, we would rather have, have them come to us on Thursdays and say, can you do this for us? But occasionally, I know Dave goes in and does uh, things for the park in the shop. Uh, Occasionally, someone else will come in and, and learn how to do something. But again, they have to have the safety program, just like our people do. So that's basically the, the history of, of us at Faust Park. <laughs> Thank you so much, Keith. And, and the more I the more I learn about South Park and our relationship, the more impressed that I am. I can't believe that it took me until whatever six months ago to even find out about the five of you and so on in that relationship. Um, so, um, what he didn't tell you about that second slide with the dog and was it turning? Yeah, it's a butter turning. Butter churn. Dog used to weigh two hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> used to. Uh, so um, we did have our Faust uh, picnic there last year, and those of us who were there were able to take this um, remarkable tour with an incredibly uh, smart and, and um, 
uh, you know, the tour, the tour guide was un unbelievable. So, so we got a chance to look at a lot of these. And it's going to be at Faust Park again next year. So you can look forward to signing up for the, um, um, the Guild picnic in some a little bit warmer weather. Um, and um, so anyway, I did check the one last time. And I think we're good till about midnight. So you should have the be safe going home. <coughs> Any other questions? And we'll see you, we'll see you next month, though. So.